Hello, I'm John Harris, and this is the 2020 Virtual Wooden Boat Festival. A little boat honed to her purpose can carry you sure-footedly over the waves into the most beautiful and remote places. So writes Roger Barnes in the introduction to The Dinghy Cruising Companion. This panel discussion is called Small Wooden Boat Design. We've gathered four small boat designers and Wooden Boat Festival regulars to chat about small wooden boats. From the state of Maine in the USA, we have Clint Chase. From New Zealand, we have John Wellsford. From the Philippines, we have Michael Storer. And from the hot and humid state of Maryland in the USA, I'm John Harris. Uh, let's do introductions right quick. Um, Clint, let's start with you uh, and uh, sure. tell us about yourself right quick. So I'm Clint Chase and my business is Chase Smallcraft. And like John, I design and build uh, boat kits primarily. I also do custom boat building uh, for some customers, but mostly I ship off kits for people to build their own boats uh, to my own design, to uh, other people's designs, such as Michael Storer, François Vivier, and uh, a couple other friends who have designed some wonderful boats and I've turned into kits and shipped them uh, all over the place. Great to have you. John Wellsford. Hi, I'm John Wellsford. Man who hardly needs an introduction, but he's going to give us one. <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's fame or notoriety, but I'm John Wellsford. I'm Currently, uh, I live on board my old motorboat down here in New Zealand. It's uh, early spring here, and I had a hobby, which I got an enormous amount of pleasure from it. And I found that by sharing the designs that I was producing, I gave the same sort of pleasure to other people, and that's my passion. So I design boats. Um, I build the occasional one for my own use and to prove the design work. And uh, yeah, so I draw boats and draws boats is my uh, handle and John Wellswood small craft design is my business. I'm very pleased to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And also Michael Storer. Yes, hi, I'm Michael Storer. <laughs> um, I run Storer Boat Plans. Um, I started off as a, a boat obsessed 12 year old. Um, and drew boats on every surface I could find. Um, uh, by the time I was at university, I swore off that and said I'd never draw another boat until I built one. So I built one a bit later when I started working, building and repairing boats. Um, and it's been my life since, um, designing boats, selling plans, and more recently making sales for boats as well. Oh, well, I live I'm, in the uh, Philippines, and, and all the chickens are my local chickens. <laughs> your, your chickens that we hear in the background, okay. And one rooster, I presume. Um, great. I'm John Harris. Uh, 26, 26 years ago, I became the first employee at a company called Chesapeake Lightcraft that makes boat kits. Um, I am now uh, the managing director, whatever that means. Um, all these years later, uh, I design uh, and build small boats and ship them out in kit form. Um, so that's how I came to be here. And um, normally I'd be heading off to the Wooden Boat Festival in uh, Port Townsend, Washington right about now. I think that, that uh, at least two of you would probably be there, um, if not, if not all, all of you. Yeah, John, you were gonna be there. Um, but there's something going on um, in the world. Um, and, uh, so I want to ask the question, um, have you noticed uh, that building small boats, using small boats, playing in small boats has become more popular uh, since uh, we were uh, hit with the Great Plague? Yes, um, I'm selling more plans than normal for this time of year and a lot more inquiry. Yeah, I, I would echo that. Uh, normally, things get kind of quiet for me. Luckily, I n normally I have teaching, and so it's not a concern. But this year, uh, I've noticed the orders have stayed steady, where, whereas, and, and they didn't drop off because everybody's off 
playing with their boats and not really thinking about building their own. Um, but uh, um, no, it stayed steady for me. And the other thing I've noticed, I've been busier with customer service because more customers that already bought the kits are really busy building them um, and asking lots of questions. <laughs> Yeah, Chesapeake Lightcraft uh, has been extremely busy. Um, something that's been uh, a challenge. There's uh, uh, more than 20 of us uh, there. And uh, obviously with uh, precautions um, to protect one another and our families, uh, it's hard to be there and actually run a factory. So um, it's been an interesting summer, uh, this summer of 2020. Um, uh, but there are an awful lot of people at home building boats, I tell you what. And um, uh, it seems yeah. like um, people are staying close. And uh, I had, we had uh, something, a similar effect during the worldwide recession of 2008. Instead of going on family trips um, to Venice, they, uh, the family stayed home and built a boat. Um, mm. Or so it seemed at the time. Uh, so I don't know what yeah. yeah I <clears throat> yeah very similar um, here um, the plant sales have gone up maybe two and a half times over normal <laughs> they've really really boomed um, the other thing I'm noticing on social media is that I'd normally see a boat of my design being launched maybe two or two a month something like that and they're hitting the water more than weekly. Sometimes mm. two or three in a week. That's what it's just totally different from what it's been before. And uh, do we think uh, I've been asked this question uh, both on panels and um, in articles and other things? Is there a shift towards small boats? Um, I go to marinas nowadays, the big cruising auxiliaries and larger sailboats are sitting on jack stands more and more. Um, my the marina closest to me was only about half full of, of big, heavy boats. And uh, uh, is there a shift towards uh, small boat sailing and enjoying small boats um, worldwide, maybe? Or is it just uh, wishful thinking because we're nerds that way? <laughs> I, I would say... <laughs> wishful thinking is okay by me. Yeah. yeah. It works for me wishful. too. Right? If it wasn't for wishful thinking, uh, we may not be sitting here, right? Um, I have noticed. I have noticed uh, a little. Certainly, I have noticed a trend towards it. I haven't been in the business nearly as long as you guys, so I don't necessarily have the the history. Um, but. Uh, for example, one thing I can say is, you know, up in Maine here, we've had something called the Small Reach Regatta, and that's been a really great event um, for people learning about these small boats and getting into them. And, and I know uh, quite a few of my customers who had have bigger boats but are just enthralled by the small boats they're very excited about it and and it seems like they're gravitating in that direction um i can't say that they've completely abandoned their larger boat but um they're just they're just so enamored by the, the smaller smaller boats the simplicity they carry the sort of adventures you can have with them uh, we have this wonderful resource up here called the main island trail which is a, a, a line of islands up the coast that really you can't look at in a CNC 30, but, but, in, a, but in a small boat, um, you can explore and you can beach it and you can have picnics and you can camp out. And I think that sort of thing is growing um, slowly but surely. And I think the Small Regatta has been one event that's had a good effect on that. Not yeah, to mention great. just all of us getting our stuff out there and 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 you could just see these boats travel around the internet like little memes you know um it's pretty pretty wonderful to see <laughs> yeah i'm a member of of something called uh like the new zealand dinghy cruising uh club or whatever on facebook and they seem super active uh john um you know I don't see big boats, you know, it seems like everybody's out in a small boat down there. Yeah. My impression is that 
there are economic changes going on in our world which are really uh, mitigating against the ownership of bigger boats, just the sheer cost and commitment involved. People mm. are working um, much longer hours. There's two jobs in the family. So, you know, it used to be that when dad got home, the, the household was all organized and you had the whole weekend as a family, where it's not happening now because they're both working. So they get home and they have to share the household tasks all weekend. And, um, the dinghies are, are working well. We, we're getting quite a lot of growth in that dinghy cruising area. But my impression is that the second-hand boat market that used to kill the dinghies because there were so many lying around, they're now so old that they're no longer viable and there's a lot more building going on. And mm. it's the, it, from what I can see, it's the only real growth area in the uh, recreational marine field is the small boats. Yeah, mm. I think that um, to such a large extent, what we do is under the radar. Um, when we, when I, I'm, my background is from a racing dinghy background. And I see that the clubs are contracting. I also see that the, um, that the, officialdom of um, small boat racing, which has been the most visible part, is complaining about the numbers dropping away and so on. Um, but we're so far under the radar. Um, we see our customers go sailing in odd little places, um, such and such a bay over in the corner of Sydney Harbour, um, around a goat island in Nebraska or something like that. Um, it's really hard to judge from my perspective. Um, we're seeing a boom certainly um, in middle class people getting involved in small boats in the Philippines, but that's a completely new thing. Um, people haven't had the income and they haven't had the leisure time to do that. Um, but worldwide, you guys would be better placed than me because you go to boat shows, um, general boat shows, um, to get a feeling of what is really happening out there. One of the interesting trends uh, has been in the kayak world, um, which is really how Chesapeake Lightcraft got started, just, just thousands and thousands of kayak kits. And uh, uh, I watched that plateau in the early 2000s, and, um, uh, and then it went entirely really recreational kayaks. And uh, I heard a number... <clears throat> um, a year or two ago, I, th I think maybe this time last year, um, that Hobie, um, uh, a couple of years ago, Hobie's annual sales of pedal-powered fishing kayaks, so Mirage Drive, you know, recreational sort of kayaks, uh, was something like $24 million in a single year. So, um, that, that, folks, is a trend. Um, so uh, people are finding that um, maybe, you know, having the, the bass boat or the fishing boat on a trailer um, that they didn't use very often and that, you know, the fuel goes bad on over the winter or whatever, hey, they can throw the kayak in and, and catch a big fish too. So um, um, that seems like, you know, a, a really big trend. A another trend that I've noticed that at Chesapeake Lightcraft is, is the trend towards the kinds of boats um, that um, that the three of you especially are, are known for is traditional small craft, I, I would call them, um, uh, sail and oar boats. And, uh, mm. uh, you know, the more of that sort of thing uh, I have done, the more of it people get excited about and um, uh, to, to where uh, there was some crossover a few years ago and, and, and traditional small craft eclipsed kayak sails at Chesapeake Light Craft. And uh, mm. suits me fine because I'm mm. kind of a sail and guy, you know, and always have that. I love kayaks too, but, um, uh, but uh, so, so that seems popular. Um, mm. And uh, I have a question, a sort of a hard question about that, um, that basically every night I lay awake in bed and ask myself, which is that have <laughs> all of the, uh, have all of the great, small craft been designed already? <laughs> I mean, seriously, look, look you know, I, I've got maybe a thousand books here in this house, um, including all the old popular mechanics books and all the 
motorboating and sailing books, things like that. Mm. People have been doing traditional small craft for uh, of the sort that, that we're talking about for 80, 90 years now and, uh, you know, doing plans and kits. Is there anything new? Mm. Wow. The, the, the designing traditional boats is a traditional activity <laughs> and continues to be, perhaps. Sorry, John. Yeah, uh, I, I think that they're, these are boats that are inexpensive to use. Uh, when you are at a busy time, you turn them upside down in your backyard and, mm. yep, you know, and no. there's no expense involved. So, uh, but, uh, but, but what about the design? I mean, uh, you know, I, I sit down and I, you know, I, I, I draw a boat and I think, that looks nice, Harris. You know, it looks exactly like one of Clint Chase's boats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like well good for you um it's already out there so where do we go from here john wellsford now uh, what i do when i'm looking to design i look first of all at the capabilities the resources that my customers will bring so that dictates what kind of material and to some degree that the build method then I take the styling cues from the traditional boats, mostly for me, those are the South Coast and East Coast English boats, and I incorporate that in the boat's visual um, appeal with, along with modern hydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. So between all of those, they come out with a boat that looks traditional, acts like a modern boat, and it's a lot quicker um, under sail or under oar than the older boats would be, um, and it's achievable for an amateur builder with limited resources and skills. So maybe the, um, you know, maybe one of the key points of, of new designs uh, is the, uh, the ongoing evolution and uh, uh, of construction methods. Uh, they're getting easier. I mean, it's getting more and more like IKEA furniture every year. Um, uh, I know, Clint, that you have a lot of slot together. It's easier to put together. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know. Well, yeah, I think, you know, what I think about, I, I, I definitely think about my, I think about myself as, uh, as a builder as much as a, a designer, but I, I think a lot about I'm designing uh, a building experience and a, and a usage experience. And so these are boats that... Uh, I think at one point, you know, the sail and oar boats, for example, think about um, one design that's called the Calendar Islands Y'all. It's a 16 foot sail and oar boat that I originally drew at, at 18 foot eight to capture when I was just kind of been drawing intuitively. And I, I think I was probably really leaning on all of my other favorite designers and kind of stealing for, you know, just little visual cues from all of them and kind of bringing it, trying to make something my own. Um, that I wanted personally, um, not necessarily that was answering uh, a need being expressed to me by another person, but something that I internally was was interested in. And I and I took that and and I really and I redesigned it when somebody finally came to me. Actually, who was a long time go down skiff uh, sailor, and he said, "Michael Storrs design." Yeah. Uh, yeah, Michael Storis Bo, and this is a, a, a young guy who came to me, who, who I'm friends with, um, and be, have, have become friends with. And he said, you know, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. And then I said, gosh, you know, that, that 18, that 19 foot thing I drew that I called the Calendar Islands, that I thought was, was a great name because it was after some main based islands. Maybe that would be really good, kind of shrunk down a little bit and it would all, it would scale well. And, and I would really design it. This is a boat that somebody could build from a kit or plans, but primarily thinking about it as a kit build. And I was designing that experience of, of building the boat um, that probably for some people, not all, would be a little bit out of bounds for them. But now because of the kit, it's within their wheelhouse. It's something uh, I'm bringing that uh, opportunity to them that maybe for some builders wouldn't have been there because it was too difficult or too challenging or just too overwhelming um, and designing that experience for them. But it's also, you know, very much a very functional boat, something they can take out on the main island trail with camping gear 
or just take out the two people and, and uh, you know, go as fast as they can or, you know, so very much with use in mind, but I was also thinking about it as a building experience that was bringing together aspects of stitch and glue, introducing glued lap straight, but without too many planks, you know, for example. So it was, mm -hmm. so it was something that was uh, amenable to maybe somebody graduating out of stitch and glue boat building or somebody who's, you know, some, somebody still pretty new to boat building overall, it was doable for them. Whereas maybe 10 years ago, that sort of boat was maybe not as doable. They would have built a mold. They would have, yeah. you know, planed a stem. They would have planed drafts yeah. and, you know, you know, that would have been uh, mm -hmm. really high parts count, so to speak. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So uh, an evolution in, in construction technology. I, you know, kind of my desire is to is to make some of these magnificent traditional boats accessible. Um, right. And uh, I had a big project that um, got eaten by the the epidemic a little bit. But uh, I'm, I'm going to do a a, a, a a 26 foot 7.7 .7 meter uh, uh, Norse Danish vessel from the 1140s. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say Viking ship, but it's not quite right. It's not a Viking ship, but, um, but it's got all those, it's got that look. And, and, um, and, uh, you know, I, so I just floated this around um, the internets uh, over the winter and i had been startled at the response um, because y you can't imagine how many of these uh, reenactment groups or things out there would love mm -hmm. to, to make their landing in a lap strake sloopy double ender mm. um, but uh the um the barrier to entry uh, uh, you know for such for building such a thing is very high right now um but it, what if it were a computer cut kit and it slotted together um but without uh, mm. uh a, a lot of compromises in aesthetics so i mean that's sort of what I think we have to live for, so to speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as small boat designers, we do have we do have some things um, to work on. I think you yeah. you and I are pretty in much of, uh, we're taking those styling cues, the the things that that really get people engaged, um, and incorporating them into what is essentially a modern structure, Com composite boat, so to speak. Michael, uh, did you? Uh, yeah. The, 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 well, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking that um, I know the designs that all of you do um, quite well. And I think we develop uh, very much a house style that I can see that both of the, I see either of the John's boats and there's no mistaking which John it is. <laughs> I see Clint's boats, his boats have a style. And I think that, <coughs> I, I think that comes from, um, that none of us really start in this type of business because it's a money earner. You know, we start in it because it's an obsession. Um, and because of that, every designer has a very distinct style. And that goes back, you know, Francis Herishoff, whoever you like. Um, because it's such a, a personal thing mm. um, that um, it's not so much that that um, anything startling and new is appearing in terms of um, boat shapes, etc. But each person has their style, each person has their viewpoint, and that creates boats that are very distinct from each other. Hmm. Keeps it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the design process itself, uh, I, I um, I've had a lot of conversations with folks like yourselves who uh, sit on the other side of the desk um, and design boats uh, when people ask. And, and I, uh, the last couple of years, I've just been asking people, do you actually get commissions? I mean, do, does someone come to you and commission a design? I, I, you know, I, if I draw a hundred boats, which I probably do in a week, um, <laughs> uh, you know, no, not in a week, but, but <laughs> I, I never stop drawing. It's, it's, it's an obsession. But, uh, you know, if, if I've drawn 100 boats, maybe one of them was actually commissioned by 
someone who came to me with a design brief and said, I would mm. like a boat like this and would you mm. design it for me? And of those, you know, if I had 10 of those, you know, maybe one actually ended up getting wet, you know, getting built and getting wet. And mm. I'm just kind of curious, um, do you find people are commissioning custom designs um, these days? Or, you know, or, or at least are helping to drive uh, the yeah, process? I, I, My, yeah, I don't do any custom designs at all. Um, I uh, did a few in the early days uh, because I thought that was the way that the business progressed. Um, but I think what tends to happen is that um, it's very difficult to get the money required for a custom design small boat, mm -hmm. you know, that we might spend three or four, five, six, seven weeks working on it. And we need to get some, to, and it's impossible to get the money back. So what we're looking for as a custom boat is something that has a broader appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and I've noticed that A, they usually don't have broader appeal and B, um, the um, customer's input actually pushes them towards being unmarketable. They're mm -hmm. too, too personal. I've got a few of um, <laughs> In, yeah, <laughs> I think we probably all have. Um, yeah. But in the last couple of years, I've actually been working with um, one of the original Goat Island, European Goat Island skip builders, um, Joost Engelens, and he goes to raid events and he kind of sees things that are um, that people are interested in and it's very much at the smaller end of things so it was a kind of like a collaboration it was designing a boat for him but it was to be very very kind of broadly based so we did the viola canoe the viola 14 sailing canoe um, let's see three years ago and he's been sailing that in raid events since, doing well. Uh, and he's seen another niche, which is for a more paddle-oriented boat from the Viola, and also a boat that will take two people. So we've, we've, I've just released the Combi um, canoe. Uh, the idea of that is to be a very flexible family boat with a modest sail area, um, which will sail quick with one person, um, or paddle, or sail with even the family aboard. Um, but the thing is that these are niches we don't often get to see uh, because different things are happening in different places. And it's just lucky that um, Yoast has a, um, presents quite a clean slate, a very broad idea. And he trusts me to do my part. And he's actually quite brilliant at doing research of other boats currently available and seeing what's right and what's wrong with them mm. so we can make some decisions along the way. Um, so that sort of designing um, works quite well, but working directly for a client really requires a very special client. I'd do it if it was a special client, which means um, clear ideas from the beginning um, rather than wanting the double bed up front of the boat so that they could walk around it and tuck in the sheets, which was one experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, it can work, but it's difficult. Yeah, I'd agree with, with Mick there in that it is, it's very difficult. For example, it could take three weeks full-time work to produce a, a 16 foot sailing dinghy set of plans at the standard that I like to produce them. I like to show every single nail and screw that goes into these things. And um, then you come back to the customer and say, well, look, that's for four and a half thousand, five thousand dollars, please. And, mm -hmm. and they Got go a bit pale day. and walk away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I have done a number of high end single handed or special purpose ocean races. Um, one of the more successful mini transats ever was one of mine. Mm -hmm. I wrote and, about that. Yeah. Yeah, amazing thing. Amazing skipper, really, the guy who built it. Um, 
but right now I'm doing, I've got two commissions on and I don't really like doing commission work because of that issue. One of them though is a 22 foot um, powerboat, a small cruising powerboat. And the other one is a specialist um, boat for an event, which we all know, but I shouldn't mention because he wants it kept quiet for a while. Um, but generally speaking, I will design a boat to suit me for a purpose that I can see that I would enjoy doing. And then I'll go and, and I'll build the thing and I'll publicize it and see if anybody else likes it. Because this for me is a hobby that got out of control and it's really the passion and my own interest in it that drives it. I totally, I can, to yeah, I'm nodding my head as, as John is speaking because it's very similar for me. Yeah, I just, you know, starts, started very personal. Um, and what I've done on a few designs, you know, yeah, I, but I also recognize that in order to make this a business, to some degree, I need to follow the money. <laughs> but um, I think I, 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 when now I, I look at the big picture, I look at my catalog of, of boats in a more big picture way than I think I did when I was just starting starting up, um, where it was just, you know, there, there, were all, there were all sorts of opportunities coming my way and I was just kind of gobbling them up. And, and a lot of those were um, huge, huge, great opportunities. Um, since Mick is here, one of them was meeting Michael and him coming to the US. Uh, huge influence, probably top three influence on, on pushing me to do what I'm doing. Uh, I, re I remember sitting down we were having uh, uh, breakfast or something. I, I think we went to an Iraqi flatbread place or something like this. And we were in, 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 in a very Mick way. He, he never tells you what to do, but he always gets you thinking. And, and so he got me thinking that I really need to jump in and do this. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I digress. But I, my, so, so I, what's worked for me is to think about, again, it's, you know, thinking about the small Richard God of that community of, of boaters, what, what, what seems to be getting people excited and can I bring them together in a sort of crowdfunding sort of way where they're each contributing, but they're part of a group. And, and that seems to have taken away some of the effect of somebody getting, you know, so sort of obsessed and taking the design away from sort of the ideal the ideal list of criteria, uh, kind of like Mick was saying earlier, whereas they're all kind of thinking as a group and they, they're doing similar kind of boating, so they're thinking in the same sort of way. And, and that's helped financially uh, take some of the strain off of putting the time into these projects. Um, and it's also given me confidence that, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get these boats out there into the world and maybe it's real slow but it's going to happen and there will be people um, building these boats and and then splashing them and using them and that's happening right now and it's been really fun to see uh, a boat called the calendar islands uh, 18 which is a larger version of the 16 i mentioned and that was really from people coming to me and saying hey, i love this boat but i need it to be bigger and, and 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 can you do this and can you do this i'm like what and i said well you know, a few people have mentioned that. So maybe we can kind of get together and form a little small community around this project and, and, and launch it. And uh, that's, kind of, that's happening now. And there's five or six people building um, this boat. Yeah. And um, I'm building one in the shop for a customer. It's a commissioned project. Um, but because he was part of the design um, group, you know, he's pretty much letting me build it as I see fit, which is kind of neat, you know, to, to be able to, um, he trusts that I'm going to build it uh, the best way possible. And um, he's really excited about it. So that's been a, that's been a real fun ride to, to see play out. And, um, you know, I seems to be working. So I just kind of going to roll with it. Uh, that may happen again. It may not. Um, I, 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 I am trying to think about next steps, you know, a, some opportunities have come to, for either collaborations or to kit a boat um, in collaboration with somebody, as well as a couple, uh, one design commission that's in the offing. 
And I'm just not sure because I'm, again, I'm thinking about that big picture. Where, where does this boat fit into the catalog and will other people really be interested in it? Um, and so I guess that means I'm, I'm becoming more of a mature boat designer to be thinking about this in a bigger picture way. But I really want that, you know, I also don't want to have so many boats I can't get my head around them all. <laughs> you know, and I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We have I mean, 115 boats in our catalog or something. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't know how you do it. I, I, you know, and I'm, and I have a small staff now and that I'm growing. And so that may change, that may help. Um, but, you know, maybe what's the sweet spot for, for Chase Smallcraft? Uh, I don't know. 20 boats, 25 boats, you know. How many are my designs? How many other designers do I form collaborations with to bring their boats into people's lives? Um, it's it's sort of a day-to-day -day thought thoughtful sort of thing I'm doing. But I think one of the sort of the universe has a um, uh, a way of, of of moderating how many designs you release and <laughs> and, and how 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 many designs. Um, uh, that you work on and, 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 um, and it's, it's two words, tech support. And, um, you, you know, as we added more and more boats, we found ourselves providing more and more tech support until, you know, here in the year 20, um, I've got, um, five, six, seven people who just, just provide tech support most of the day, and and um, so there was a there was another um, Chesapeake Lightcraft once. Um, it was called the Rutan Aircraft Factory. It was uh, uh, run by a fellow named Bert Rutan, um, who's become very famous. Um, <clears throat> Bert Rutan uh, started as a uh, selling plans and kits for uh, uh, home built aircraft, mm. uh, light unusual um, uh, design specifically to be easy to build and all of this. And uh, I just read a uh, biography and, and, you know, he, 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 fold, he folded up the business uh, in the early eighties, uh, you know, at, at the height of his fame really. Um, and the reason was that he, uh, there, there was a, uh, you know, a, a non-geometric amount of tech support that, that he was generating as he came out with more airplane designs um, to, to the point that he was spending more money providing tech support for builders than, than was coming in from plans and kit sales. So, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of feel like the, the universe does have a, have a, have a way of, 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 of regulating, um, all of the crazy ideas I have, which is to say, yeah, John, you can get this out there, but can you support it? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so, so that's, you know, that's one of the, the things that, that becomes a discussion at Chesapeake Lightcraft. But I, I say, aside from that, about 10 years ago, I woke up and I said, uh, what becomes a new design at Chesapeake Lightcraft is what interests me personally. Um, mm. in, in terms of actually a score in the marketplace, so to speak, um, the designs that I found interesting were way more successful than ones that were that were workshopped, that were focused, mm. groups, you know, that kind of thing. And then, you know, we did some of that kind of stuff. And, and, and some of that generated outstanding boat designs that were completely boring. And, uh, you know, uh, so I, it's been a long time since I really thought about, oh, is there a hole in my catalog that I need to fill with a boat that's shaped about like this? Mm. It's really, hey, what am I interested in right now? Mm. And that's what, that's what we're going to work on. And uh, it's at least as good a guess at what the marketplace is interested in. And of course, social media, um, following, following the trends as much as I can. So I use social media as my tech support, or part of it anyway. Um, the big Facebook page that generates a huge amount of traffic. And I will often see somebody ask a question which requires some support. And a builder who's a few steps further down the road will pitch in and say, hey, I did this. And all it needs for me to do is to go in and say, yep, that's the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And and that is, is both a marketing tool 
because the, that's effectively my own magazine, if you like, my own yeah. publication. It gets out to an awful lot of people and it's, it's people are seeing these boats going together. They're seeing uh, a community and belonging to that community is very, very important to a lot of people. It's mm. not only with the community that you get when you've got half a dozen boats pulled up on the beach or one guy who's building visiting another guy who's building. It's the community of uh, commonality, of common interest and so on. That, and people want to join that. And it's a really, really good thing. It gives them something to belong to, which is often missing from the, com the modern workplace. Marketers call that an affinity group. Yeah. Well, you know, I call it vertically integrated marketing, right? So mm -hmm. all the way from the idea through to the end product is you're hooking people into into something that they can belong to. And belonging mm -hmm. is very important because we are a, a, mm -hmm. um, a gregarious and social animal and and the world is very isolating in many respects. I, I can be wary of the yeah. The whole internet tech support thing myself. Uh, you know, I had an experience uh, t 20 years ago. I, I drew a, a really very simple double ended, basically a skiff called the scary. And um, uh, it's been very popular. Um, but early in its, in its, um, in its life, it had a, it had a nasty bump. And um, it started with one of my tech support guys at Chesapeake Lightcraft giving bad advice, um, which, for which I take responsibility, but you know, it happened. And so a builder kind of got off a little bit and he migrated to a internet bulletin board that had built up around this one design, the scary. Um, it was just, I think maybe this was back in the days of Yahoo groups or something. I, and this is a long time ago, but anyway, they all got off kind of in the wrong direction and and hmm. it was it became a, a, instead of a uh self-correcting um community um then it really became quite a mess and, and i i realized you know, I, we were experimenting with le letting go of of tech support a little bit and, and letting the internet you know um uh, help us out, so to speak, um, for free. <laughs> and, you know, you get what you pay for. And, and, and what we got was a bunch of, uh, a bunch of scaries where folks didn't have a good experience building. Anymore. And, and it was really our fault. I mean, it, we should have stopped that right when it started. So, um, the lesson I learned very hard then, um, and I, I still, I still get punched in the face by this at least two or three times a day is, is uh, getting our documentation um, that goes out with the kit perfect. I mean, I can, I can design a boat tonight, cut it on the CNC machine tomorrow morning, glue the puzzle joints tomorrow afternoon and assemble the entire hull the next day. And, um, and that's wonderful, gee whiz. But if I didn't, if I don't have a, an assembly manual um, that, is adapted to the meanest understanding. I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, then, you know, it, it, boats like that can become a liability, um, not just for uh, a business reputation, but, but literally a liability because it may not, it may not be seaworthy. So, mm. uh, you know, I, I found that the, the, the cost of the documentation is, is, is another, uh, uh, another, Kind of universal force that pulls upon uh, our our design house and and yeah. and and influences what we do and and whether we we go yeah. through this. Um, yeah. Well, my current long steps design, and I'm building one up in the shed at the moment. There's been two built already. Um, I'm up to 44 A4 pages, and and I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, by, by the way, uses mixed sails, which makes life mm. really easy. I've designed it around around his his sails. That's yeah. a good way to do it. Yeah, it's a little bit of mutual support, you know, and that's very important in our community as well because we need to see ourselves as a community and support each other where we can. I'm I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And, uh, Chesapeake Lightcraft has has thrived. Uh, the more I feel like I support uh, other boat builders. Uh, through the years, it's the, the rising tide has certainly helped. Um, yeah, but hey, a, a, a comment here about boat builders. I have more trouble 
with uh, professional boat builders than I do with amateurs. The boat yeah. builders will build it the way that they see <laughs> in their head, the way that they've been trained to do it, the way they have, their experience tells them to do it. And if I'm doing it somewhat differently, then the, the, there can be problems. Yeah, I got one like that. I'm not going to mention the builder's name because he's world famous. <laughs> but I've told, his boat didn't come out right. I'll tell you that. Um, right. Yeah. 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 But he wouldn't. He didn't look at the instructions. And uh, yeah. so there you go. Yeah. Um, well, um, yeah, they, the professionals never read the instructions. Yeah, you know the other. There's the other side of the coin. You have the amateurs who are mechanical engineers and. Uh, oh, they, practical they, men. Mechanical engineers who are used to measuring things um, uh, <laughs> to, to, to five and six decimal points. And uh, mm. if you know anything about stitching glue boat building, which is really what all four of us are mostly concerned with, you know, with, with variations, um, it's, a, it's a horseshoes and hand grenades kind of boat building proposition. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I get a guy who says, look, man, I got a real problem here. And, you know, I, I, I've really, I, my project is at a dead stop <laughs> and I just, I don't know how to go forward. And I'm like, well, what's tell me about what's going on. Well, I have got a gap of almost a 32nd of an inch in this bulkhead. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, can you just shove some more epoxy in there and get on with it? That's, uh, you know, so, yeah, that's, that's education. And, um, you know, if I'm at a cocktail party, somebody asks what I do, I, I, I say, well, I teach people how to build wooden boats. Um, and mm -hmm. in order to sell boats, I have to teach people how to build boats. And I have to teach people how to be comfortable um, with it. And so a lot of that's documentation. A lot of that's just getting out in the world and doing seminars. A lot of it's wooden boat school, bless them. Um, and... Uh, you know, being an educator, writing about it. And, um, uh, and, and I, I think that's sort of like how I spend all of my time at Chessman Wright Craft is, is simply whether it's writing or speaking or demonstrating on, on the cameras, here's how you do something. And, um, and yeah. that's, that's, that's something that's very different from, uh, from say the 1960s when, um, and I've, I've, I, there's a talk I give about instruction manuals um, that I give to professional organizations and, and um, like engineers and and I and I one of the samples I bring is the Rudder magazine article um, by Mr. L. Francis Hershoff. You may have heard of him. Um, uh, entitled "How to Build a Rosinante." <laughs> now. <laughs> the Rosinante is a uh, 28 foot carval planked catch with uh, outside lead ballast. And, uh, you know, and, and the article, the How to Build a Rosinante article, which was aimed at the amateur and uh, speaks in language uh, modulated for the amateur, is, I think, 14 pages long um, and has five or six drawings. And, um, you know, I. I don't know how many of them got started and and got into a big problem. I don't, you know, but um, uh, I think that the responsibility to help builders get to the end um, is what mm -hmm. drives our business. You know, if they, if they, one, don't finish the boat or two, if it looks lousy once they're done, mm -hmm. it's not good for your business. So um, that's a, you know, that's, that's um, a, it's a huge challenge for me. I recently had my first. Yeah, they're, they're really all like Sorry, Mick. Go ahead, Clint. I was just going to say, I, I recently had my first bad experience with, with a customer who just went way off track. And, Will you, you tell know, us and his it, name? <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, he, luckily, let's just say he hasn't been posting on Wooden Boat Forum and these sort of things. And he's, he's kind of to himself in, in, off in the mountains um of of uh, in the middle of the country but he it, it, it was a huge it's been, it was a huge learning experience in many ways uh, I, I can't even begin to go down start going on the list but but a big one you know while he was in the process uh he, i realized 
okay, I, I need to, this is a great opportunity for me to really crisp up my, the, the instructions and the plans and he, he wanted some, some feedback. And so I, I gave it back to him in the form of, you know, better, better drawn plans and more clear instructions. And, and, and man, this, this is the best manual I have yet um, because of him. But yet after all that support and feedback, it was still a total, total disaster. And, and it's unfortunate because it's a boat that's, that's gotten out there and been used successfully and, 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 and done some pretty cool uh, trips and, and races and things like this. Um, but it, 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 it's fresh, it's fresh for me. So, so I'm taking that forward and thinking about, you know, for example, getting back to limiting the number of designs, that's a, there's a, there's a, yeah, sure. <laughs> that, that'll put, that'll put a little kibosh on, on, on just, yeah. you know, I mean, bumping up the number of books that are being put out there, but I'm trying to look at it positive. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'd love to hear what, what you guys have done when you've had this sort of situation where a boat really is just total disaster. I don't think he's had a successful sea trial yet. Um, and he's tried three or four times and what, um, but, but, but how do you, how do you handle that customer where no matter what you do to help them, they, they go a different way. And, uh, you know, that frankly, you know, there's incompetency involved too, but there's also this, strange sort of maybe it's an ego sort of thing happening where where they ask for more instructions and, and more clarity and you give it to them but they still do something totally different it's, right. it's just been it's been it's been wild um uh quite quite yeah. Wide, but yeah but yeah that's that's always going to happen um every every five six or 10 years, there's going to be this thing that almost pulls you to a dead stop, mm -hmm. that it's so terrible that it's happened. Um, but that doesn't mean that the strength of the business and the strength of um, your, your personal strength that's making it happen has diminished at all. Um, what um, happened for me um, in terms of developing my idea of how to run the business was that in the early days, while we were still um, faxing information we're getting in questions by fax and mm. snail mail and having to answer those um, was that the builders or the designers with the best documentation were the ones we really really wanted to sell the kits for um, and at that time there were the, the Bear Mountain um, book canoe craft and the Ian Autred plans Autred plans um, which were both really, really nicely documented. Um, we could sell those and anyone who contacted us would have a really well-directed question. Um, people who came up with a popular mechanics boat with four pages, four sheets of drawings and three pages of notes, they would have countless questions and difficulties and problems happening. So from the very start, I saw this and I recognised that um, to make the business work as a boat design business, it has to be scalable. So it goes back to what John was saying about documentation. Um, the, the documentation has to be self-sufficient. Um, so the business um, has this um, starry-eyed, our business has this starry-eyed section of um, the initial inspiration of the boat, putting the lines on the paper or the lines on the computer or both. Um, but then there's the documentation. Then the work so starts. So you have the 1% yes. inspiration, 99%. Mm -hmm. Yes, then the work starts. So, so it's 1% inspiration and 99% documentation. Mm -hmm. That's certainly the case, uh, you know. I yeah. But, but we certainly can, there's this yeah. emotional thing that when things really, really turn crappy. Um, yeah, go John. We've, we've had um, assembly manuals um, that uh, cost into the six figures to, to bring to market basically. And there was a, you know, we were aware that this was happening, that it was costing this much, but um, we realized that uh, it was really a binary decision. Either we make it easy for folks to build 
they're going to have a good time and tell their friends that they had a good time. Uh, they're going to tell social media that they had a good time with the project or, um, or we just put it in a different category of boat on our site. We actually have literally done that. We have this section of, of series of designs that we call pro kits that basically um, have just plans maybe, or maybe a very small instruction manual or something like that. And, and we just filter people out and say, hey, look, you need, to have, you need to have built some boats before you get to this. But, um, choosing your customers is an important part of not mm -hmm. running into a, a catastrophe <laughs> um, mm -hmm. such as such as Clint has just had and that I've had you know three or four times in the last year or two. Hmm. So. I, I've, um, in fact this brings up several other points. One is that where does our own experience and our own skills come from? Right? So how are we designing? How do we, where does our knowledge come from? For most of us, it's reading books and then going out and doing it. I, yeah, I've got a library like that too. And um, I had the, I've been in his, I've been in his office. Yeah. <laughs> really? I have been in his office, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I had the, the wonderful experience of teaching marine design at university for a couple of years which I tell you what, there's no faster way of learning than teaching. Mm -hmm. than, yeah. And these days I run um, essential skills for the beginner boat builder courses at the traditional boat building school here. I run three or four of them a year, two day courses. And, and that takes the very basic knowledge, the basic stuff as how to use epoxies, how to sharpen your tools, how not to take a finger off, <laughs> Those sorts of things, when, yeah, yeah. When you're using a bandsaw, just the real basics, and it's it's two two days, fairly fairly full on. Um, a lot of that has um, formalised my knowledge. So I'm taking the knowledge of structures and hydrodynamics from the university course, and the practical skills that I'm teaching at the other end. And all that goes into my design work. Whereas when I began, I sat down and drew what I thought was a pretty picture and did a couple of very basic calculations around the, the center of buoyancy and the center of effort and put the plans out there. And, and I was very pleased that they worked. And looking back, I think I was very lucky that they did because <laughs> I was opening myself up to some real problems if they didn't. But now I've got designs out there with three, four, 500 boats in the water and the feedback that comes back from the people who are building goes back into the product support. That's the, the builder's manual. And it also goes back into me and that knowledge gets incorporated in the next one. Yeah. So it's a, it's a circular system. The feedback helps me get my product better. The better the product gets, the, the better the result and so on, round and round and round. So it's a continuous learning thing. Um, and I think we all of us started off by reading the books. You mm. know, we had a dream, we played with boats and we incorporated what we were reading with what we were doing and started there. But all of us, all four of us have an enormous amount of experience, which we now incorporate into our design work. And that's really what the customers are buying. Mm -hmm. Well, we are, um, we're coming up on time here, um, but I want to, I want to have one round of, of something fun. And that is to ask each of you to tell uh, our viewers that if um, suddenly uh, you just had a free shop and uh, expenses paid for, for six months or 12 months, um, what small wooden boat would you design and build for yourself? And we'll start with John Wilson. Okay, well, I'm already doing it. I had, you know, I've done all, all sorts of things. My design work has taken me all over the world, literally, right? Tierra del Fuego, England, um, New England, and, mm -hmm. and uh, the Pacific Northwest and across into Asia. But there's always the feeling that there is still the life-defining adventure is still out there. And, you know, the years keep going past. I'm not getting younger. And it's way past time I got on with the life-defining adventure. So I designed Long Steps. Long Steps is a 
a very long range sail and or cruiser, ocean capable. Not ocean capable in terms of sailing from New Zealand to Australia, although worse boats have done it. Um, but the sort of thing that if you had to spend an overnight at sea to get from one harbour to another, you could do it in safety. So I'm busy building that boat now. Um, there's two of them in and sailing and the boats are performing very well. They self-write, they are rowable, they are comfortable and they're quite quick but they're, um, they're a big build. There's a lot of structure in them. There's over two tons of buoyancy incorporated in them. They've got a little bit of shelter. Um, yeah, so I'm already doing it. And what comes after that one? Well, wait until the workshop's empty and I'll see something that I really want to do. And there's a stack of plywood in there spare and 25 liters of epoxy and I'll be into the next one but I won't make the decision until I've been sailing this one for a while because my next need will be based on how this one goes. Mm. Michael Storer, what would you build uh, for yourself? Well, um, I live in the Philippines um, and the Philippines is a nation made up of 7,500 islands. I've also got a young family. So I keep thinking of the um, the plywood multi-hull designs of the Australian designer, um, Locke Crowther, um, who was hugely influential before he died prematurely um, on the world scene. And uh, he had a little trimaran called the Buccaneer 24. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to do an update of that. Yeah. Um, purely for personal use. Got my sketches use. of that one. Um, <laughs> all the local boats are multi Yeah. Oh. All, all the local boats are multi-hulls, um, so the locals know how to handle them when typhoons come and so on. Um, so it fits within the local use pattern and to get places fast, you know, because often we don't have as much time as we think we have. Hmm. And well, it would Chase, be beautiful. <laughs> what, would you build, what would you build for yourself? I'm in New England and... and and Sam Manning's drawings of dories are also a large part of why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I think I'd reimagine one of my earliest drawings. I, I you know, luckily because of because of his work, I, I just had to draw my own dory. So I have one called the Deblois Street Dory, and it's great. It's an it's an amazing dory. Uh, but I want to redraw it and build it out of. I want to build it like a real dory. It is a real dory, but I want to build it like a real dory. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little plywood and epoxy, but you know, get some cedar and pine in there too, and um, oak gunnels, and uh, here comes the Dory book. And <laughs> there it is. And um, take it um, on some adventures, very much in the style that um, Sam did, where he, he did some big he adventures. He was famous in for, in for the Gulf of Maine. adventuring in his Dory, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and, and really, do, do some big adventures. I recently changed the tagline of the business to um, boat or explorers because I realized such a big part of, of building a boat is, is an exploration process. And then once it's on the water, you're just starting that exploration process. And I realized really that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing. And so I want to make sure I get that experience too. And uh, I look forward to doing that. Building a boat is an exploration as well um you know, I, I think i speak for all of us that building it i have as much fun building the boats as i do using them i think and uh, my i was accused of this maybe at around age 14 by my parents who were who were um trying to deal with all the boats that i was piling up in the garage so, you were like building them were you like using them you know? and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah so yeah i guess uh, anyone who's uh, who's uh, uh friends with me on facebook has been been seeing a uh, a long and even tedious stream of canoe yalls go past, and I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I really want a small, you know, sub twenty foot, heavy, round bottomed uh, canoe yawl with a uh, mm. study cabin, um, no engine, and uh, uh, just just to go uh, pick my way in and out of uh, of creeks and coves and. Uh, I've been working on this design for 25 years and uh, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, small boats are fun. Uh, and the fact that, um, that this 
this conversation, this panel could literally be unstoppable. We, we could still be here in two hours. Oh yeah. It goes to show, uh, I think the, the level of passion that, um, uh, that our community has for small boats, especially uh, if you've ever been lucky enough to, been, to, to, to go to the Port Townsend Wooden Boat Festival. Um, it is mm. Valhalla for small wooden boats. Um, I have, I, I come back from that show so inspired and uh, with, with my camera full of photos of cool boats that I saw there and, and cool ideas. And um, uh, I wish we were all there, but um, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to put up with us just talking about it for now, but I'll see you there next year. I hope, I hope I see you guys there. Um, and in person and not digitally. So uh, cool. John Wellsford in New Zealand and Michael Storr in the Philippines. It's very early in the morning. You could hear the roosters <laughs> there uh, here on the U.S. East Coast. Uh, Clint Chase is in Maine uh, where the sun's going down and, uh, and I'm in Maryland likewise. Uh, it's been great fun. I hope we can do this uh, again soon. Um, and I hope, yeah. that, I don't think we need an excuse uh, to do it, but I want to thank uh, Barb Trailer at the Wooden Boat Festival for um, uh, for continually uh, nagging me uh, until I put it together. So, um, thanks so much for joining us uh, for this um, for this video chat. And uh, go out, find a small boat, any small boat, and go have fun in it. I've had more fun in an eight foot pram than just about any boat I've ever owned. So, yeah. Ooh.